Hey, this is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. Hope everybody's doing well today. We are going to wrap up our study on angels this afternoon. It's Friday, August the 14th, 2020, and we have, I, I, I would call it a, we've done an extensive study on angels in the Bible. We started by setting up a definition. We went through the Old Testament passages talking about angels. Not every one, but... Uh, most of them. We went through the Gospels and looked at angels. We went through Acts. Now we are finishing up the New Testament today. And uh, the study today is going to be taken beginning. I need to get my Bible over there. We're going to begin in the book of Second Peter. We finished up yesterday in First Peter. I want to go ahead and say this. Yesterday in First Peter, as we were beginning, um, get to my slide here. All right. In 1 Peter chapter 1, one of the passages we, passages we looked at, somebody commented and, and asked a question about 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12. So I'm going to read that verse again. And what this is talking about in the, in the prior verses, from verses 6 through 9, Peter talks about the persecution that these Christians were enduring, the gospel that they had heard, and the fact that they were, it, it, throughout this process of living faithfully, of enduring persecution, they were going to receive the end of their faith. That is the goal of their faith, which is the salvation of their souls. And then he talks about that salvation beginning in verse 10 down through verse 12 and, and talks about the fact that those things were revealed in the prophets in the Old Testament, but those prophets didn't fully comprehend the, uh, the fulfillment. Uh, they, they didn't see the full picture of their prophecies as we do today because the gospel has been preached to us in its fullness. They didn't have that benefit under the old law. And so, included in that thought in verse 12, he talks about um, the gospel that had been preached by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. And so the, the word there for look in the Greek language, the idea is that they, they had kind of like they had stooped down, they had stopped to, to stare at something. And it, it has to do with their interest in our salvation. And I talked about that a little bit yesterday, but the, the meaning of that term, it's an aorist verb, which is a, a simple past tense verb. They had, throughout those times, looked into with curiosity, you might say, the meaning, the end, the goal of those prophecies about salvation. And so uh, just like the Old Testament prophets, uh, who, again, didn't have a full comprehension as we do today, the angels desired to look into those things. Just an interesting thought to me. But today we're concerned with 2 Peter, and 2 Peter chapter 2 primarily. And I have verses 4 and 11 here, but when you start reading 2 Peter chapter 2, you will see that the issue being addressed, the subject being addressed, is false teachers. Uh, beginning in verse 1, there were false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you. And so he talks about their character, uh, their conduct, the fact that they would make merchandise of people's souls. And then he says that, uh, well, I'll just read verse 3 here. By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. False teachers will suffer punishment. They are going to stand in judgment before God and give an account for what they do and what they continue to do. You know, there's a strange idea out there that, that some people have in the religious world that there really isn't such a thing as false teaching. You know, just so long as you believe that Jesus is the Christ, that He's the Son of God, just as long as you believe that He was dead, that, that He died, that He was buried, and that He rose again, everything else is secondary. It doesn't really matter. That's just not true. I mean, sure, the, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the deity of Christ, those are foundational principles of the gospel system. And there, you know, there is no room for disagreement or differing opinions on those subjects. But that's not the only subject. There is error. And, and those who teach it are going to be punished. That's what he then illustrates. He talks about that in verses 1 through 3. That's what he then illustrates with, with various incidents from the past. He talks about the angels, verse 4. He talks about Sodom and Gomorrah, verse 6. And uh, we're going to look at Jude. Jude does the same thing. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, 
and did not spare the ancient world of Noah's day. So three groups of people, angels who sinned, the, the, the sinful people of Noah's day, and then again, Sodom and Gomorrah. <clears throat> God didn't spare even the angels. And again, the context is false teachers. Their punishment is not slumbering because if, if God punished angels, he's certainly going to hold these false teachers available, uh, available, accountable. And then down to verse 11, it says, Whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. And this is talking about the, uh, the false prophet, the false teacher's attitude, how they're, you know, they're not really concerned with authority. And, you know, that really shows in, in the, maybe not necessarily the lifestyle of a false teacher, maybe a good moral person, but their doctrine's wrong. And so they really, they, they struggle with authority. <clears throat> and I've run into, the, into this myself over the years. When you confront a false teacher, a public false teacher about their error, they will, I mean, they'll get mad at you. I'll never forget. This happened several years ago when I was uh, living and preaching in Pensacola, Florida. I went to a funeral and uh, I don't remember the connection, but it was connected with somebody in our congregation. But you know, I don't remember all the details, but anyway, a Baptist minister, a Baptist pastor did the funeral service. And as usual, at the end of his message, he, um, he invited anybody in the crowd who, you know, if you've not accepted Christ into your heart, would you please raise your hand? Well, some people raised their hand. And then he said, I want you to recite this prayer with me and you'll be saved. Of course, the sinner's prayer, which is completely unbiblical. So we go through this process. Um, and on the way out, of course, there's a line greeting the pastor, telling him how good a job he did, kind of building up his ego. And so <laughs> uh, I just I grabbed his hand. We were shaking hands, and I forget what he said, but my, my, the only thing I said to him was, listen, uh, you just told people something to do to be saved that's not in the Bible. And, you need to, and my, my words were, you need to teach them what the Bible says, not what your Baptist doctrine teaches. And it kind of shook him up a little bit. And he looked at me and he said, I've been doing this a long time, boy. Don't tell me. And I said, well, you're teaching error. He said, don't tell me, boy. When you look at Second Peter uh, chapter 2 here, false teachers struggle with authority. They don't like being told that they're wrong. And, you know, the fact of the matter is most humans don't like to be told that they're wrong. We, we want to be right. I think that's just a natural um, a natural desire. But hey, if you're wrong, you're wrong. And don't challenge someone. And I forgot, one of the things he said, besides calling me boy, he said, I've been doing this a long time, boy. Don't talk to me, something like that. But, you know, he went right to the appeal to authority. You know, I don't care how old you are or how long you've been doing something. If it's wrong, it's wrong. Your, your age and experience doesn't matter. False teachers struggle with authority. Angels know better than to uh, buck up against especially God's authority. So that's 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 11. And so the next passage where angels are mentioned, and I already talked about this, Jude addresses the very same issue, and he uses the same language. He talks in, in the book of Jude, his purpose for writing was to, con to encourage the Christians to contend earnestly for the faith, verse 3 which was once for all delivered to the saints. And then he says this, uh, For certain men crept in unnoticed. I think the King James says unawares. The Greek word's interesting. It means they, they came in by the side door. They, they kind of snuck their way in. False teachers. Um, where am I? Okay. For certain men crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turned the grace of our God into lewdness, it's a financial term, and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So then you go down to verse 6. It says, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, okay, they, they resisted authority. You know, Peter said they sinned. They didn't keep their proper domain, but left their own abode. He, God, has preserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. The great day is the last day when Christ comes back for judgment. So again, you, you have these two passages that tell us that angels sinned and fell from their state, 
from their condition. Now, let me insert this here real quick. Um, Lucifer, all right? A very common misconception is that Lucifer was an angel and that he became Satan. And so, therefore, Lucifer is Satan. This is all Isaiah chapters 13 and 14. Lucifer is not Satan. Lucifer was never an angel. Lucifer's not the devil. I mean, there's even a television show about Lucifer. It just shows you how ignorant people are of the Bible. Lucifer is the king of Babylon. I mean, just read the context. Uh, it, it, so I've said a couple of times in this study, and I think it's important to remember, a lot of what people believe about angels is based on what they don't know. It's based on their ignorance, just like believing that Lucifer was or is an angel and that now he's Satan. Absolutely not the case. So 2 Peter chapter 2 and Jude 6 touch on the same issue of false teachers, and both authors say, hey, we have these examples from the past of how God deals with people who resist authority. Angels don't, uh, uh, they're not excluded from that, from that category. All right, let's talk about the book of Revelation. By far, in your New Testament, the book of Revelation talks more about angels than any other book. So, I'm, in fact, there are so many verses, I'm not even going to try to cover them all. Remember what the word angel means. In both the Hebrew, the Hebrew term is malak. We would spell it M-A-L-A-K. The Greek word is angelos. And we just, again, we pulled the Greek letters into English, and we translated it as angel. It means messenger. And again, sometimes it can mean an angel, all right? An angel from God, an angel from heaven, like Michael or like Gabriel. Sometimes the word angel would have been better translated into our English versions of the Bible as messenger. So when you get to Revelation chapter 1, one of the most important verses in all the book of Revelation or most important sections, are the first three verses. So I'm going to read those, and we'll go from there. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to show his servants things which must shortly take place. All right? If you miss that, you miss the whole book. Um, and he sent and signified it. If you miss that word, signified, you're going to miss the whole book. Um. One way that I've put it in, in teaching through the book of Revelation, which I've done a few times over the years, is don't, don't miss the big picture of Revelation by trying to figure out, figure out every minute detail. And I'll tell you, I don't understand every minute detail of Revelation. I know what the whole thrust of the book is, and that's Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. And In fact, let me turn over there just real quick, and then we'll come back to Revelation chapter 1, because... Again, we have to set the, the context and the theme. So here's the theme of the book, Revelation 17 and verse 14. These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. For He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with Him are called, chosen, and faithful. That's the thrust of this book. In the midst of great persecution from Rome, you can be victorious. The Lamb is going to win, even though at times it feels like the, the lamb and his calls are losing. This book is about Roman persecution. And I know some people say, well, it was written before A.D. 70, and it talks about, it's talking about Jerusalem. That is absolutely incorrect. And I think there's one verse that nails that down. This book is not talking about Jerusalem and the destruction of Jerusalem. And that's Revelation 17 as well in verse 18. Because it's talking about this woman, all right, this woman who is persecuting the church. The woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. This is a first century document, and Jerusalem was not reigning over any king of the earth. You know who was? Rome. That's what this book is about, Roman persecution. It's not about Jerusalem. So many people miss that, though. So back to Revelation chapter 1. You have to understand, number one, these things must shortly take place. Now, that doesn't mean it's all going to happen successively in a matter of months. I mean, obviously, we understand that. But it's also signified, verse 1, uh, who bore witness to the words of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this, prophet, uh, of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near." 
you have to ask yourself two questions. Question one, to whom was John writing? Well, you look at Revelation chapter 1 and verse 4, John to the seven churches of Asia. So you have to ask, to whom is he writing? You have to ask, why is he writing? Well, to show these seven churches of Asia that they can remain faithful even in the face of great persecution from the great city, which is, you know, which represents Rome. Thirdly, you have to ask, what's the time frame? The first three verses of the book tell you it's going to shortly come to pass and the time is near. Um, it, it, again, this has nothing to do with the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, AD 70, a lot of people try to tie that in. It, th then they just miss it. And so they're looking for things that aren't there because they've, they've got the wrong time frame. Anyway, what in the world does that have to do with angels? You've got to understand the context of the book. You've got to understand what the word angels means here. So I've got up here on your screen the first um, three chapters and references to angels. So, for instance, Revelation 1 and verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand. This is Jesus speaking. And the seven golden candlesticks or lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Why would churches be called a lampstand? Well, Philippians 2.15, uh, Matthew 5.13-16, the church, uh, God's people, we are a city that sit on a hill. You don't light a candle and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And so these angels, as it's called here in verse 20, or these seven stars, are the angels of the seven churches. And there are different, differing opinions on that, and I don't think you can be dogmatic about that. You can't say, well, I know exactly what these angels are. I don't. There are differing views. Some say, well, that, uh, that each angel of the church represents the preacher. Eh, I, I'm not convinced of that. I've heard another view that says, well, those seven angels of the churches are the elderships. Again, I, I don't know. Possible. Some people say, well, the angels of the churches are basically the heart or the spirit of, the seven, of, of each of those seven congregations. And I guess if you dug deep enough, you could find merit with any one of those. I'll just tell you, I don't know. Uh, John will define his symbols as you read throughout the book. That's an important thing to remember, too. So throughout chapters then 2 and 3, you will see a message like this. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write. And that happens with every congregation, okay? Ephesus, chapter 2 and verse 1. Um, Smyrna, chapter 2 and verse uh, 8. Pergamos, chapter 2 and verse 12. And it goes all the way through chapter 3. So again, whether it means the, the preacher, the, uh, the eldership, the heart or spirit of the congregation, I don't know. But this is the audience of the book, and that's how that word angel is used there in those passages. And again, so, and I put this up here on the screen, but it's a vague comment, but there's, there's just so much. There are just various angels throughout the rest of the book. And I noticed my little typo there. Throughout the rests of the book. That's incorrect. <laughs> throughout the remainder of the book, there are so many angels, um, messengers sent to John, who is on Patmos for the word of God. <clears throat> One thing that's pointed out to us in, and let me go ahead and say this too, and I've said this in a couple of my previous videos, I've put together this outline um, in PDF format, and it has all the references. I don't have them here on this PowerPoint. I didn't want to take the time to do it, just to be honest with you. Uh, if you would like to have a copy of that, I'll be more than happy to send it to you. Uh, just let me have your email address. You can send that to me on uh, Facebook Messenger. You can put it here in the comment section, however you want to do it, and I'll send you that material. I think it's nine or ten pages, but anyway. One of the things that we learn about angels in Revelation that we've talked about uh, throughout this study is the fact that angels are uh, higher than humans and they're they lower than the divine. They're lower than deity. They are not divine beings. They are created beings. Again, Psalm 148, verses 1 through 6. But on two different occasions, after John receives a message from an angel, he has this response to it. So the first one here I've got referenced is Revelation 19, uh, verse 9. Then he said to me, Write. 
Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the, these are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant. And we've talked about that. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14. Angels are God's ministers. They are his servants. That, that uh, Throughout Old New Testament times revealed his will and helped accomplish his purpose. So I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the uh, testimony of Jesus. And then you have this direct statement. Worship God. Angels are not God's. Um, they're not divine beings. They are not worthy of our worship. And in fact, this one just, I mean, out, outright forbids it. Worship God, because that's what angels do. All right, read Revelation chapter 5, if you, want to, uh, if you want to read about that. And then Revelation 22, verses 8 and 9. Uh, then he said to me, these words are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets and his angel uh, sent his angel uh, to show his servants the things which I must, sh which must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me the things. Then he said to me, See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren the prophets and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God." And notice the language here. It's a little bit different in chapter 22. Um, I'm your fellow servant, your brethren, the prophets. Listen to this. And, and of those who keep the word of this book. Angels are subject to the word of God, to God's authority. So they're not divine beings and they're not worthy of our worship. So those, uh, those two passages at the end of Revelation are important to keep in mind in a study of angels. Uh, we talked yesterday from Colossians chapter 2, that a sign of false humility Paul talks about in Colossians 2.18 was angel worship. Don't do that. Um, they're not worthy of it. They're not divine beings. And then we have this here, and this will be it for today. The book of Revelation is bracketed with something. Uh, so let me go back to Revelation 1 and verse 1. And then we'll go to 22. Uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. Again, you have to pay close attention to those words. So then we go to Revelation 22 and verse 6. Uh, this is an angel speaking to John. These words are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servant the things which must shortly take place. So there again, you have that time stamp, things which must shortly take place. And then verse 16, uh, Revelation twenty two sixteen, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you, to John, and to the seven churches, these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, <clears throat> the bright and morning star. So Revelation, the, book, the entire book of Revelation is bracketed with this idea of these messages were delivered to John by an angel. And again, throughout, and we've noted that several times, throughout the whole Bible, we see that to be the case. Um, you know, I, I, I'm thinking back, Acts chapter 8, okay? Philip was told by the angel to go communicate with the eunuch. Uh, an angel told Cornelius, Acts chapter 10, you need to send to Joppa and you need to find Peter because he, because he has words to tell you. The angel didn't do that directly to Cornelius, and he didn't do it directly to uh, the eunuch. They got messengers. And so John is receiving this message from angels, and he's writing it down. He's signifying it for the seven churches of Asia. And the things are, at ne the, uh, the things are near, the things are at hand. We have to understand those time statements and the context of the book of Revelation. Uh so that's what I've got. That's angels in the Bible. And like I said yesterday, I thought about doing another video. Uh, I did a separate video on guardian angels. You can go to our YouTube channel and find that on our playlist on angels. I, I thought about doing a separate video on misconceptions about angels, but I'm not going to do that because I've done 10 videos on this. And uh, I, I don't think in every one, but in most of them, I talk about to some extent different 
misconceptions that people have about angels. Okay, just for instance, Lucifer, all right? He's not an angel. Uh, some people have the misconception that that cherubs are babies with wings. It's not true. Um, what else? Well, I don't know. I've covered it, though. So I'm not going to go back and do it. Today's going to be the last one. Um, I don't have any questions or comments that I see. I have one comment here that I'll mention um, from Connie. I don't understand how people don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand how people don't understand shortly come to pass. Yeah, that's uh, that's kind of puzzling, isn't it? I mean, what? And here's how you have to read the whole Bible. What did that mean to the original recipients? All right. So the church at Ephesus gets this document. We call it the book of Revelation. They get this long letter, and they read in the first few sentences, it's going to be shortly come to pass, and the time is near. They're under Roman persecution. Okay, They're, they're in Asia Minor, scattered in various parts of that region. Rome's the dominant world power. Again, Revelation 17, 18. How did they understand it? That's how we have to look at the Bible. So I'm, <laughs> I agree with you, Connie. I don't understand how people don't understand shortly come to pass. And, and here's the thing. Uh, you know, people today are still looking for fulfillment of prophecies from the book of Revelation. You know, they're, just for instance, they're still looking for the mark of the beast. Uh, I did, in fact, this past Sunday night, I did something here at Mammoth on, on that question of, you know, is a cashless society a sign of the end times. No, there is no sign. Jesus is coming as a thief in the night. So there's, there are a lot of passages like that. So I'm, I'm with you, Connie. And another person comments, plus at the end of Revelation, behold, I come quickly. Yeah, and, and here's the thing. He didn't, so when Jesus does come back, and we know that he is, I mean, he told us he is, and the angels who's, who were talking to the disciples who watched him go into heaven said, He's going to come back just like you saw him go. Acts 1, verses 9 through 11. He's not come back yet, but he will. Um, he, he would come quickly, Revelation 22, uh, near the end of the book there. It may have been verse 16, I don't remember. Uh, God has come repeatedly throughout history. You, you can read throughout the Old Testament prophets, all right? And we're not going to take time to dive into all this today, but I mean, judgment after judgment, God is pictured as coming on the clouds or with the clouds in Isaiah and in Ezekiel and in Matthew 24. And we know that those are local uh, judgments of God against a particular nation or city. He didn't come personally and visibly, but he would use people like the Babylonians or the Assyrians to be his instrument of judgment. He used the Romans as his instrument of judgment in A.D. 70 to destroy Jerusalem. And that's what Jesus says in Matthew 23 and verse 37. Um, your house is left unto you desolate. So uh, it's so important to when you study any book of the Bible. Okay, who's, who's writing? To whom is he writing? Why is he writing? When is he writing? You know, what's the purpose of his writing? All these questions just... We have to treat the Bible, and you understand what I mean by this, it's the inspired Word of God, but we need to treat it like we would treat any other book. We respect its context. We consider the author, the purpose of writing, and all those different things. So that's all I've got. You guys, I see some of you are talking back and forth, and I appreciate that. Another person comments, they don't understand that 666 is the mark of man. If you want to call it a mark, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, uh, what is it, Revelation chapter 13 talks about that. Again, you know, <laughs> Jesus was not prophesying that we're going to have microchips put under our skin. What relevance would that have had to the church in the first century? Anyway, all right. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this study of angels. Like I said, it, it helped me quite a bit. Don't base your belief on angels, on your ignorance of the Bible. Know what the Bible says about it, because there is so much revealed about angels. Now, again, as I've said... There's quite a bit not revealed, but there's too much that is revealed for us to wonder, you know, are they, are they floating around on clouds with halos and wings? Are they playing harps all the time? None of that is in the Bible.
but it's a pretty common belief a lot of, among a lot of people. All right, guys, I'm done. Hope you have a good weekend. I appreciate you uh, joining in, and uh, we'll go live again, Lord willing, on Monday. And I've got a couple different requests of study. One was prayer, and actually a, a fellow has asked me a couple of times to do a series on prayer. So I'm thinking I'm going to start that on Monday morning at 11 Central. We'll, of course, go live Sunday at 1045 with our services here. And uh, this Sunday I'm preaching on from still uh, from the, the one series from Ephesians chapter 4. This Sunday morning I'm preaching on the one faith of Ephesians 4, 5. And then Sunday night will be questions and answers. All right, so y'all have a good weekend. Have a good rest of the day. And we will see you on the next video.